I'd like to call to order the Forsyth County Board of Education meeting for September 19th, 2023. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda before us? Second. Motion by Mike and a second by Tom. All in favor? Unanimous. Do I have a motion to go into executive session for personnel and, edu and student educational records? So moved. Motion by Tom. Second. Second by Wes. All in favor? Unanimous. Do I have a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. <clears throat> motion by Tom and a second by Mike. All in favor? Unanimous. Do I have a motion to approve personnel A1, B1 through 7, and C1 through 7? So moved. A motion by Tom and a second by Mike. All in favor? Unanimous. <clears throat> Do I have a motion to deny student out of district appeal 520 and 521? Second. Motion by Mike and a second by Tom. All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Forsyth County Board of Education meeting. It is June the 19th. June. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me just, let me just, I'm going to do full disclosure here. I moved my dad into a nursing home today and it's been a long, hard day. And so no telling what I may say. So full disclosure, you all know it's, you know, my brother just called me and was telling me, well, he did okay at supper because, you know, it's just, it's hard. And I, I left the bathroom water run and I'm just a mess. So full disclosure, I'm sorry. It is September 19th, 2023. If you will all rise, we'll say the pledge. I remember it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first on our agenda we have recognitions with a su superior spotlight with Brookwood Elementary. Welcome. Hey, Rachel. Well, good evening. I would like to take this opportunity first introduce myself, Rachel Moidy. I'm the proud principal of Brookwood Elementary. Um, I am just honored to be here tonight to just showcase some of the things we are most proud of at Brookwood this year. Um, I'd also like to thank each of you. I've never been able to officially thank everyone for the opportunity to serve as principal at Brookwood Elementary. Um, it is an honor to lead this community and I wouldn't want to be any other place. So I don't take this responsibility lightly. And um, I'd like to just go ahead now and um, also thank you for your support for the leadership development programs in Forsyth County. I know I would not be in this position today without the commitment to growing leaders. And with that, I also promise to do my part to continue to grow leaders in our district. I'd like to take this time now to introduce my administrators that I have with me today, um, Dr. Brandy Ford and Mrs. Becky Cahill. So we are very proud of the things we have going on at Brookwood, so we're gonna go ahead and spotlight some of those now. So here, I wanted to, like I said, thank you for the opportunity to be at Brookwood. And it's so much more than just the principal role. Um, for me, it is an extension of my family. I consider uh, my staff members, my admin team, my students, just an extension of the family, and I know um, they do as well. So here we have um, just some examples of connections that we were able to make right away in our community. Our amazing PTO helps set up meet and greet opportunities at the neighborhood, um, the clubhouses and the pools. And so we had families come in and uh, just looking to make those connections before school started last year. Our PTO also helps support monthly spirit nights at local restaurants and so it gives us an opportunity to come together to see everyone outside the school setting um, and it, we really are fortunate that we have them monthly actually and we have great participation with that so along with being principal i also have the honor of being a parent of brookwood elementary my son is in second grade so we've been able to experience um, first day of principal first day of new school and then now again this year i'm um, having uh, being there together and i will say it's not easy being the principal's son, but he gives some good feedback. So unsolicited, I will say, but um, he keeps 
it, it's a it's a good connection to have that, and um, it's something that I think, well, he thinks is pretty cool right now. We'll see how it goes for the rest of the years. I also have pictured here at the top um, our my core team, and along with the core team, I also have my front office staff. This this connection is what really started to drive our work. Here we are having um, just an, a team building experience this summer. Kind of fits with the theme that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. But um, without these ladies, I mean, they are the driving force, and um, they are why we are where we are today. So. Let's dig into some of the things that were established at Brookwood before I came in as principal, but we were able to build on this year. So we start you know, with having our work support our district vision of you know, creating a safe, connected, commun and thriving community for all. So in starting with our staff and forming those connections, we focus on a theme. We started last year with We've Got This Together with a focus on the power of collective teacher efficacy and working together to power through our first year together. And it, um, it was easily woven in to all of our work. And at our very last faculty meeting, we switched it to We Did This Together and celebrated our work um, for, throughout the year. And transitioning into this year, our theme is so to grow. We are pouring into our staff members, every staff member, and making sure that they have the nutrients they need to thrive. So it's not just professional development, but we're looking at pouring into them on a personal level as well so that everyone can be the best versions of themselves at school so ultimately we can have that impact on our students. Brookwood has been uh, a seven mindset school for a very long time. So uh, it was deeply embedded in the work. We're continuing that work. We have strengthened our positive learning environment team. So that's made up of uh, various staff members that led by Mrs. Cahill. And they help to build those strong relationships throughout the school. We have um, established houses in Brookwood. So every student belongs to a house and they are represented by multiple grade levels and it gives our students an opportunity to feel that connection and to come together to support our seven mindsets and also our school-wide behavior um, initiative which is ROAR. So our students at Brookwood, we ROAR and we are responsible, open-hearted, accountable, and respectful. And our opportunities through house meetings, and then also adding in this year house buddies, this is something that we brought back based on teacher feedback. Um, they were looking for stronger connections during house meetings, where it felt overwhelming with having so many students, they didn't have those personal connections. So we set up house buddies, and that gives them chances for, let's say, a kindergarten class and a fourth grade class to come together. They're talking about, what does ROAR look like throughout our school? How can we show what it means to be responsible, open-hearted, accountable? and respectful. And then they're also weaving in our mindset lessons into those times. So we're looking forward to what that's going to build upon this year. And one just, I think, one of the best examples, I was able to pop into a first grade, fourth grade combination um, for their first house buddies meeting. And they also, we have our specialized instruction classes um, that meet with their um, linked grade level or classes as well. And one of our students was sharing, how, um, they asked, how would you define uh, being open hearted? And she used her communication device to share kind. And the rest of the students started cheering. And they just, they made that, they saw that she was so proud to share her definition through her device. And she wouldn't have had that um, same, I think, just the power of the, the students and their, how proud they were of her in that moment. So that was one of the biggest takeaways there. And then moving forward, you know, adding on to ROAR and our um, positive and behavior incentives, we are in the pre-planning phases for PBIS. And so we're looking forward to growing that initiative and working towards implementation for next year. So that kind of sums up the foundation, our core work of what we have going on. So let's talk about some things that are new this year at Brookwood. So last year, and planning, we were in the planning phases for our Heritage Night. I included a parent survey in our newsletter, and I just asked them for their support with a special project. I didn't give details or what that would look like, and at that time I wasn't really sure how that was going to, to come to fruition. But we asked our parents to share their home language, and then how do you, how do you say hello and welcome in your language? 
research. So with that, we took just a simple parent survey and turned that into a welcoming piece of art in front of our school. So you'll see here, uh, we had this family, was, they were leaving open house, and on their own, were trying to find their word. And then they did, and I was just really excited to see it happen naturally, so I asked if they would take a picture for me so I could share that with us. And then um, the other family, they are one of our frequent walk-to-school families. So they walk... Um, every day, sometimes with sister from middle school. And even this past week, they had their grandparents there. And I saw she was able to go and show them um, the word in their language. So we're just, what started, you know, it's just, it's permanent. It's here forever. We have space to grow. There are more squares to add more uh, words. But it is an instant connection with the school. And we have such a unique makeup for our school. Um, but we have a little video here for you guys. I think the students will do a better job of explaining. Um, just the significance of our work. Sometimes it's just the smallest things that make the biggest impact, isn't it? It's just really neat to see that. Thank you. Here we go. Okay. So, you know, that is something that we have going on outside, outside of our school that I think is having a big impact. But I would like to give Brandy and Becky an opportunity to share something that we have going on inside our school. All right. Thank you guys for having us tonight. Um, so as you guys all know, um, communication is the key to building connections. And at our school, we have a really unique opportunity. We have students who are learning English, but we also have the opportunity to recognize and value the multitude of world languages spoken at our school and in our local community. So we had the idea of how do we help these students and families feel welcome. And actually started at like a really small event at the end of last year. We had a new family coming, um, it was like a Thursday morning. I just happened to be walking by. They speak primarily Mandarin. So I used my very limited Mandarin, which is the word hello, by the way. <laughs> um, and I just said hello and welcome to the building. And then they walked onto the classroom. But I realized there were so many students in our school who could have done such a great job connecting immediately with that family, welcoming them and letting them know you're not alone. You may not speak English yet, but we have people here, friends here who can bring you in immediately and connect you. So that was sort of the impetus for this idea. Um, so from there, we thought about how can we take our students who speak English and another language and have them connect with the students who don't yet speak English? Could they come together during lunch? give that child a chance to be heard during the day because it can be really isolating to not really speak the whole day because you're not sure what to say. So how could we build those connections? Then we thought, well, some of our older kids, our fourth and fifth graders, could they do the same thing maybe for adults? So could they be ambassadors for us when new families come? Could they be there to greet them and to help us welcome them to locations around the school? So we felt really strongly that this was going to be a huge connection for our students and our community. But we didn't just want to throw something out there and then it kind of quickly fizzle. So we knew we wanted to start with language alike, but we knew we needed bigger connections from that. So we started to develop a three-year plan. So in wanting to be able to watch our garden grow, to connect back to our theme of so to grow, we knew we needed a plan. We needed to plot our course and design what our garden would look like. So over the next three years, this year, as Ms. Cahill has already shared, we're really focusing on building those connections 
through languages. Students are having lunch bunches together. We're doing the ambassadors. We're creating lots of opportunities for all of our students to find those connections through the commonalities of language. Over the next two years, we're planning on working on building connections through individual interests. So that's coming up next year. We have lots of fun things in plans for that. That plan will continue to develop and revise and be refined over the course of this year. And I'm sure that we'll see things that we planned for this year that'll need to continue into next year also. Then for year three, we really want to work on that safe, connected, thriving piece of our vertical teamings. And so we want to build connections through the pathways and look at our feeder schools. How can we develop connections with them for our students so that as they go to the two different feeders of South and Piney, that they really feel those connections and that we've built authentic connections in our building and throughout our community. <clears throat> well. Thank you for giving us the chance to talk a little bit about what's going on now at Brookwood and what we have planned for the future. Do you guys have any questions for our team? I just want to say that I'm really proud of you guys. You know, I've been at Brookwood a long time. All three of my kids went through Brookwood, and you guys have done a phenomenal job. It's always been a phenomenal school, but the last couple of years haven't missed a beat, and it's been actually exceeded, I think, everybody's expectations. I think I told you one day, Ms. Moiti, that I've heard nothing but rave reviews from the community. So good job. Well done from the end user perspective. But Brookwood will, will always be special for us, and you guys have just made it that much more special. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Anybody else? Yeah. Thank you all. <laughs> OK, we'll take a short recess in case you all don't want to stay for our. <laughs> <laughs> or anybody else doesn't want to stay for the business portion, now will be a good time. We'll take about two minutes, and then we will start back. Okay, if I can have everyone's attention, we will <clears throat> get back to our agenda. For public participation on agenda items, we don't have anyone signed up. Okay. Um, we have before us a consent agenda. Um, assuming everyone's had time to look over it, get any questions answered. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve? Motion by Lindsay. Second. Second by Tom. All in favor? Unanimous. Okay. Next we have presentation and discussion items. And that will be our finance report with Mr. Larry Hamill. How are you this afternoon? Fine, so. Good. He's so entertaining. <laughs> Can you present it in Mandarin? I was going to ask the same thing. <laughs> I'm going to try to get my dyslexia going and talk that way. Maybe that will work. Um, so th tonight we're going to discuss the uh, financial statements for August 2023. As always, we keep goal three in mind when we talk about financials. So tonight, we started the uh, month off, August 1st, with 120, almost $127 million. The cash receipts and disbursements were normal for this time of the year, and we ended up with $103 million at the end of August 31st. On the revenue side, um, we have 9.38% collection rate already for the year uh, through the end of August. This time last year at 9-11, we're slightly ahead of schedule. And um, the big one I noticed was that Avalorum were really ahead of schedule on that already. So a lot of people are paying their bills up front, I guess. Um, with the year-to-date report on the expense side, we are at 17.1 percent, excuse me, we're at 15.23, uh, I'm sorry, 17.1. i got to lift this up a little bit here. Hold on. And this time last year, we're at 16.95, so we're slightly ahead on the expenses by 0.15. That's not a big jump. Sometimes there's some differences between uh, July, September, uh, excuse me, July, August, September, and where some things get spent earlier versus they get spent later in October or November. De uh, service cash. So um, we started this time last year with about $115 million. We're down to 85 As you can see, debt service, we're um, trying to move as much of this money into LGIP fund next to it. So we've got $10 million in the LGIP, only about 636 in the debt service account. 
The SPLOS 5 LGLP account's got about 31 million, and SPLOS 6 is up to $42 million. Uh, this past month, we got $5.7 million into SPLOS. 700,000 of that was money that Department of Revenue apparently had a new program they interpreted into their system, and they found $700,000 in revenue they had sent to other departments and stuff by ERA. So they sent it to us as a one-time payment. Well, that's nice. Special revenue funds are on uh, exactly where they need to be this time of the year. Of course, typically, you know, we're closing down most of the special revenue funds uh, through the end of September, so we're almost done with those. So what you're seeing is really just the residual from the previous federal funds. The new federal funds don't start to October 1st. On capital projects and school nutrition, as you can see, we got uh, any balance of about 27 $0.3 million in capital projects. Uh, you can see we spend a little bit more than we brought in with transfers. Um, that's normal for this time of the year. Uh, we are spending that money down pretty fast. Uh, we will be closing out SPLOS 4 at June 30th, so that fund will finally be closed. We're closing <coughs> out the 2014 and 16 bonds this year. Uh, we're also going to have SPLOS 5 down to its last couple million dollars, and SPLOS 6 is uh, – you know, ramping up with all the projects that you just approved and consider agenda. With the investment summary, this time last year we had about $87 million. And again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to put as much cash as we can into these investment funds to draw the interest rates. Interest rates are somewhere about 4.75 right now with the LGIP. I imagine it's going to keep going up a little bit more as they start putting more and more money into higher uh, yield funds. They typically lag about a month or two behind on the rates. Uh, general fund, we got about $33 million in there. Debt services, that 10 we talked about before. You can see the th SPLOS 4 count is down to 1.7. Uh, the SPLOS 5 is down to 31, and SPLOS 6 is up to 42. Uh, this time last year, we had about $2 million in SPLOS 4, $50 million in SPLOS 5, and about $20 million in SPLOS 6. One thing I do want to point out is you look at the August collection to 5.7. That's where that extra $740,000 came in. If you kind of take that away, you can see it's pretty much in line for the last three months collection-wise. If you go all the way to the right, you'll see that because of the $700,000, it shows that we're about 15.83 collections over the previous uh, year. But if you take away that $700,000, you're closer to 0% on that. So going back all the way back to February when we were first – seeing possible signs of recessions, you can see how it's been close to zero or slightly below or bo above the number, less or minus 5%. Um, and so we're just kind of right now, the economy is just is kind of floating right now. It's trying to decide what it wants to do. The one good thing about Georgia is Georgia really uh, set up well to um, take care, to do well during this recession period. Uh, a lot of people are saying we're out of recession. A lot of people are saying we're just slightly above it and coming out of it. It just depends on who you talk to and what time of the day is, I guess. Um, disbursements for the elementary schools. Um, this time last year, we had about 4.3. The receipts and disbursements are normal for this time of the year. On the middle schools, we had about $2 million. We're at 2.2. And high schools, we're at uh, $6 million. We're about 5.6. And once again, this receipts and disbursements were normal this time of the year. The overall balance at the schools is $12.8 million. It was about $12 million, and the percentages haven't changed much since last year. High school is the same. The only difference is elementary and high, uh, middle school changed percentages by one point. And that's the financials for August 2023. Any questions? Yep. Well, one one with the SPLOS tracking, with what we had planned, is it about what we had planned? Because we usually plan very conservative for SPLOS income. Yeah, so the, the good thing on that, I guess you can call it good, is right now um, we're $15 million ahead of schedule on where we're collecting, which means if you go and project that percentage out for the rest of the 60 months, we could, in theory, collect the mine mines early at the rate we're going. Okay. That's what I was thinking, but I wanted to make sure. So we hit the cap. Yes. Good thing is you get all the money. Bad thing is you lose them nine months of collections. Typically, we had a, the we were planning on collecting three hundred million. At the rate we're going, if we could collect all sixty months, we'd collect almost three hundred seventy million dollars. 
And that's after we pushed the collection rate up, think up by 12% over previous times. So we pushed that pretty high. Wasn't there just a Georgia law about that where we could continue to collect it? It depends on... It depends on the, when, when you reach the max. If you reach it within, I think, a month or two, you can collect that last month or two. Well, but, but nine, nine months. not in nine months, you could not, no. So no. If, if you're at, two, if you're at $292 million and you're collecting $5 million a month, mm -hmm. and that's the last month of that quarter, they'll let you collect the whole next quarter. 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 Yes. Gotcha. But if, you're gonna, if they think you're going to go over before that, then they're not going to let you collect. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, next we have action items, and there is nothing under that. So points of information, Dr. Rudin, do you have anything? No. Okay. Um, I don't think we need another recess, do we? No. Okay. How about public participation on non-agenda items? So I guess everybody knows our rules, and first up is Chair Crescell. Thank you. My name is Jerry Rochelle. Last month, we had a dramatic farewell speech from a troubled child who had spent 13 years in Forsyth County schools. Their perception was one characterized by sorrow and anger, and sadly, I believe that they are not alone in their deep-seated resentment against the world at large. But it doesn't have to be that way. Sorrow can come to us all, but how we react to it is what determines whether or not we move forward with hope or retreat into resentment. When we are taught to believe that the solutions to our problems depend on forcing others to change their behaviors, we are creating learned helplessness rather than resilience. When we are taught that our own actions are the largest part of solving our problems, we gain the tools of success against adversity. Larry Elder often quotes his father who said, you get out of life what you put in it. You can't always control the outcome, but you can control the effort. No matter how hard you work or how good you are, sometimes things will go wrong. Character is about how you react when they do. Now, this isn't to say that depression isn't a thing or that cross-hormone treatments can't exacerbate mental health issues. Thankfully, here in Georgia, it is now illegal to chemically sterilize mentally ill children, and it could be that much of the resentment expressed last month was a direct byproduct of medical malpractice. There are more and more notable cases of detransition coming to light as time goes by, and as those lawsuits move through the courts, we may hopefully hold the doctors and hospitals involved accountable for their pediatric experiments. That all being said, I have great hope for the future, and I want to give my sincere thanks to the Forsyth County School District for some great work. I was pleasantly surprised to hear my fourth grade daughter talk about a wonderful anti-bullying book being read in her class that she was really enjoying. Way of the Warrior Kid by the Navy SEAL Jocko Willink has no sexual content, does not focus on superficial identity groups, and promotes a strong, health-positive narrative with a perfect dollop of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. It is exactly the kind of book that both liberals and conservatives should want their children to read in school, and should become required reading for all fourth graders in our district. I am grateful and proud that the school district my children attend has teachers who share books that reduce resentment and empower children and focus on personal responsibility as a virtue. This is exactly the kind of education everyone, regardless of their own intersectional identities, should want for our children. There are plenty of great books out there that handle challenging topics without being graphic. There are plenty of great books out there that resonate with everyone and touch on universal human character rather than crude stereotypes of feminine and masculine. These are the books we need to fill our libraries with. I'd like to ask the board to please make Jocko Willink's Way of the Warrior Kid a fundamental part of our anti-bullying programs, and again, adopt specific policies that let parents have a role in getting good books into our school libraries, in addition to the policies we have to help them get age-inappropriate books out of our school libraries. And so on that note, thank you very much for your time, and again, I'd love to have lunch with anyone who disagrees with me. According to Merriam-Webster, the definition of all is every member or individual component of. On the Forsyth County School District facts sheet, it states that the vision is a safe, connected, and thriving community for all, that our beliefs are all students and staff must be connected and supported, all students and staff must have a strong sense of purpose. This comes from the strategic plan that I participated in. I remember these points, but this is not Forsyth County Schools. I have one request tonight, and that is for you to remove the word all 
Forsyth County Schools leadership and board does not care about all students and staff. Just because it is in your statement does not make it so, even if you capitalize it in your emails. And Forsyth County Schools, if, For if Forsyth County Schools really cared about all students and staff, then it would protect all and support everyone. But sadly, it does not. If you are black in this community, your history is hidden. There is no respect for what your ancestors have gone through and how they have contributed to the American story. Instead, you are treated like your history is not American history. Your history is taken from classrooms, like books about Abraham Lincoln and George Washington Carver. You are denied the ability to take black history courses. You can no longer access modules that teach about civil rights and Jim Crow. If you are a member of the LGBTQ plus community, you are not part of the all. This is demonstrated when a district apologizes for the use of the word gay. Being gay does not require an apology. You are not part of the all if books about you or your parents are being removed from libraries and classrooms. You sit and watch as hateful people call teachers groomers because they want all of their students to feel connected and supported. People are demonized as pedophiles because they are trying to live out the Forsyth County Schools beliefs. Staff members are being attacked by people pushing destructive agendas. Instead of this group supporting the staff for following the vision, mission, and beliefs, they are now self-censoring, afraid of being bullied by a loud minority in this community. Imagine being a member of a marginalized group as a staff member here. This body does not stand with the staff. Instead, you have some that want to tear down the great schools in this county by supporting vouchers. Please remove the word all. Doesn't apply to us. This evening, I have some things to say about mistakes and apologies. When you allow the extremists who sued you for the opportunity to stand in this room and perform dramatic readings about blowjobs and masturbation, regardless of the presence of children, to create a hostile environment of such divis divisiveness and fear in our schools that you apologize for the use of the word gay to factually describe a human being, you have made a mistake. When you capitulate so completely to the extremists who slander our educators, calling them pedophiles and groomers, that you apologize for the use of the word gay to factually describe a human being, you have made a mistake. When you compare the use of the word gay to teaching kindergartners about the horrors of the Holocaust, you have made a mistake. When you say all students and all families are welcome and supported in our schools, yet apologize for the use of a word that describes some students and some families, you have made a mistake. I was raised, and I raised my children, to know that when you make a mistake, you acknowledge it. You apologize to those you have harmed with your words and your actions, and you strive to do better. This community, deserves better. Do better. Next we have Angie Dornell. <clears throat> I'm glad I've followed these ladies because this is going to change it up a little bit, but it fits. In 1971, I was in the first grade. My print's this big because now you know how old I am. <laughs> I remember a little girl being picked on ruthlessly, and it stuck with me, I guess, because it was my first exposure to seeing a person teased like that in person. 
She wore dresses and bows in her hair, but she looked uncomfortable, awkward, and something just didn't fit, and little kids picked up on that. Nearly 20 years later, in 1990, I started a new job in my hometown, and on the first day, I noticed a face that looked very familiar, and it's amazing how much that face hadn't changed that much, but that little girl was now wearing a flannel shirt, blue jeans, and a ball cap. He recognized me, too. We started reminiscing, and he told me he was pulled from public school in the third grade by grandparents he loved very much, but he was placed in a private, unaccredited Christian school. You see, he could not change who he was. He wasn't indoctrinated from a book or in a classroom or by friends. He was born this way, and his journey had not been easy. Going back to 71, my first little friend, my best friend at school, was a little girl, and we would call each other on the phone but one day her mother told me she couldn't talk to me anymore. It would be years before I would realize why her mother was protecting her. You see, my new friend was black. Her mother had been in the same public school system just 10 years before the segregated one. She didn't know me, she didn't know my parents, and she knew some white parents wouldn't approve of our friendship. Civil rights law changed things, but laws don't necessarily change minds. Today, over 50 years later, parent and political alliances have campaigned that LBGTQ equity and awareness is some kind of new indoctrination tactic to groom children in public schools. Some say teaching uncomfortable truths of modern history is too heavy or unnecessary. We've gone past that. From DEI, CRT to SEL, education jargon has been redefined to influence and activate upset. And the bullies are now the adults on the political playground with slander and rumor on social media being the bathroom wall. The opportunity for this district to be leaders in standards supporting inclusion and diluting overreaction is now even more challenged with new state laws providing opportunity to legally exclude. If age-appropriate classroom library books are being removed because a child might see an illustration of two mommies in a book about different kinds of families, or a storybook about challenges people of color have had, are no longer in the classroom because that's just a little too divisive. That's not a parental right. That's not a parental value. It's a 2023 20, example of appeasing discrimination and calling it policy. Next, we have Kim Hogue. Is that correct? No? Okay. And then we have Renee Klarakovics. <clears throat> I usually try to talk to you guys like you and I use my words, but tonight I'm waiting for somebody, so I got my hair done so you can see the top of my head. <laughs> So I learned that a middle school teacher, or middle school teachers, are limited to a list of around 20 books they are allowed to read to students. Any book outside of that list has to be submitted for review to a committee, questions answered, and then approved or not based on its merit. This seems like a very Stepford way of introducing kids to books. I've heard from teachers who enjoy reading to their students, chapter by chapter, new books, classics, funny books, engaging books, that gets kids excited about reading. And these typically are not found in the list of 20 approved books. Those books are dissected, analyzed, and taught in class. Those are for work. A scenario played out in my head. Two teachers talking, one from our district, the other not. Hey, Sarah, have you read the sideways stories from Wayside School to your class? My kids were just tickled by it. Is it on the list? No list? What list? If it's not on the list, we can't read it. So what have you read to your kids lately? Oh, we don't actually read books to students. We tell them about books, give a synopsis, and then if they want to read it, they can pick it from our class library that's already been censored for us. And that brings me to my next concern. At the elementary level, these books, and there's a stack, and I don't know that I can actually show them, but they're pretty awesome. This one kind of goes to what they were just talking about. A lot of families. Um, these books have been pulled from classrooms, and I think you might recognize that most of these books 
include or maybe even mention families in the LGBTQ community. Or they mention the lived experience of black people in history, in our country, and one covers an immigrant story of a family from Cuba. I'm pretty sure the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education believes this is a problem in Forsyth County Schools, that is a problem Forsyth County Schools has that needs to be addressed. I don't think these censorship actions are what they had in mind. If you guys want to see these, I have them. So. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> That concludes our public participation. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion by Lindsay, second by Tom. All in favor? Unanimous. <laughs>